We talk a lot about serotonin. We don't ever talk about GABA. It, it's time is coming. It's a very important neurotransmitter when it comes to anxiety. Stress is a cycle. It's not unlike the arousal cycle. Like it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But the way we lead our lives, we're just stuck in arrested development. We have our beginning and a middle, and we have not brought our stress to resolution. Magnesium Breakthrough is my favorite magnesium supplement. Click the link in the description to save 10%. So you have this really unique approach to looking at anxiety. It's not the actual problem, but it's like a compass we can use to detect where the problem actually lies, which is a really different way of looking at anxiety. So I'd love for you to extrapolate on that and talk about what you mean by that specifically. Yeah. So the way I put it in the book is that anxiety is not the final answer. It's the beginning of our inquiry. And I think it's actually a pretty profound departure from how I was trained to think about diagnosis. If you think about conventional allopathic Western medicine, our crowning achievement was antibiotics. Like we're forever trying to get back to those glory days where we were actually really potent and we could see a problem and we could say, okay, it's this bug. This antibiotic is what's going to kill it off give that to the patient, problem solved, and you've saved a life. And that was so great. And so we're forever trying to achieve that. Even in mental health, we're trying to say these symptoms equals this diagnosis indicates this medication and as if we walk away cured. But as we know, it's not quite so simple with mental health. And so I don't think of anxiety as the final answer. And I don't think it indicates a treatment that creates a cure. I think it's the beginning of the inquiry. What is the true root cause in this instance what's actually causing this individual person's anxiety. Well, the beautiful thing about what you're doing that's different, like you mentioned there, you get to the root cause. On the other side, though, it involves doing some deeper work. Yeah, you got to roll up your sleeves. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, there's no one cause of anxiety, even in any given person. It can be so many different things. And so for some people, it might have a number of different uh, physical root causes. Someone might be inflamed or... Um, dysglycemic, like their blood sugar is swinging up and down and that's contributing to their anxiety. And somebody else, it might have a very psycho-spiritual basis. They might know on some deep inner level that they're in the wrong job or in the wrong relationship or that they're supposed to step into some role in their life that they've been avoiding. And so there's a lot of potential root causes. Well, within the examples you gave there, you describe what the broader heading would be true versus false anxiety. Exactly. So I'd love for you, before we go deeper into things, let's talk about the difference there and then we can go, go deeper. Yeah. So that's the central thesis of the book is that rather than classifying anxiety as generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder or OCD, I really think about it as false or true. False anxiety is physical anxiety. It's avoidable anxiety. It's the anxiety caused by some stress response that gets tripped off in the body and that feels identical to what we call anxiety or even panic. And I don't call it false to invalidate the very real suffering of false anxiety, but it speaks to the fact that there's this straightforward physical cause and a path out that's readily available to us. True anxiety, on the other hand, is it's not something we should be pathologizing. It's not avoidable. It's not something that we can gluten-free or decaf coffee our way out of. It's an inner compass nudging us, asking us to slow down and pay attention. And frequently there's a call to action baked into it. And it's, it's basically asking us to acknowledge a truth that's been kind of whispering to us from within, but we might have been ignoring it for a while. And it's telling us, take action, transmute this feeling of anxiety into purposeful action. And when you're working with somebody right off the beginning, they come to you and say, you know, I'm suffering with anxiety, describe what they're going through. Is there subtleties in the difference of how people feel and how they explain that feeling when it's true versus false? Or do you really just have to look at the lifestyle and see if there's things there that could be contributing to the false? I certainly have my suspicions when I first meet a patient, but I'm often wrong. And so the, the logical procession is to start with the false anxiety. That's the low-hanging fruit. Those are the quick wins. And basically going through a false anxiety inventory, identifying any potential root causes of that person's anxiety, 
addressing them. And then once you're on the other side of that process, it kind of clears the air. And what remains is often their true anxiety. And they actually often have a, a clearer connection to their true anxiety once their physiology isn't being pinballed around back and forth all the time. And so that's how I usually approach it. But life is never so textbook simple. So sometimes it's a little bit of a, a process of toggling between the two throughout somebody's healing journey. And early in the conversation, you mentioned inflammation and blood glucose as being a couple of these, these factors that could be at play when it comes to false anxiety. You talk about in the book, which is, which is funny and, and obviously true, when somebody comes to see you until proven otherwise, you assume there's an issue there with the blood glucose and fluctuations. So talk about that and how often you're seeing that. Mm, yeah, I do. I, when I meet someone with anxiety, I do assume that it's a blood sugar issue until proven otherwise. And there's no judgment here. We, we are all products of our food landscape and in the modern American diet where we, you know, our diet is based on refined carbohydrates and coffee drinks that are actually milkshakes and rosé all day. And so, so many of us are on this blood sugar roller coaster. And when someone's blood sugar, I mean, your audience knows this all too well, but when our blood sugar crashes, the design of the body is to have a stress response. And that's what cues the liver to break down our storage of starch in the form of glycogen. That's what cues us to kind of have forage behavior. It feels like a potential life or death scenario to the body to have low blood sugar. And so what that looks like, what that feels like is it's just a stress response can feel synonymous with anxiety or even panic. And so I have so many patients who they're not even necessarily diabetic or pre-diabetic. Probably their primary care doctor has never mentioned anything to them about their hemoglobin A1C or about their blood sugar. So it's not like you're out of the you're not you're not out of this even if your doctor's never mentioned anything to you. A lot of us operate with subtle dysglycemia. And the real gold standard here is if we take steps to stabilize your blood sugar, which has doesn't have side effects. It has side benefits to doing that. This is going to promote energy and longevity and so many good things. But if we take steps to do that and you feel less anxious, there's our answer. So say somebody, this is a suspicion and somebody you're working with, what are the first steps for them to correct that? Yeah, it depends on the person. Uh, sometimes someone seems ready to do somewhat of a dietary overhaul, and then we're transitioning their diet toward a more nutrient-dense, real food, blood sugar-stabilizing diet. And for some folks, that looks sort of paleo template, but basically moving away from refined carbohydrates towards getting your carbohydrate from starchy tubers. Some people, it might look more like a keto diet or intermittent fasting to train their body to be, um, to have more metabolic flexibility. But for some people, it's really just dropping the refined carbs and the sugar. Um, and you know, many and introducing more healthy fats, just making sure every meal is more balanced. You know, we, we have so much misinformation these days and we perceive that we should be doing clean eating where it's a matcha latte with oat milk and arugula and a chia seed pudding. And you could be eating perfectly clean and be starving and malnourished with your blood sugar flying all over the place. So I try to re-educate that it's not just about clean. In fact, that's a pretty misleading idea with food. Um, it's really that we want to aim to eat similarly to how our great, great, great grandmothers might have been trying to eat. And there's balance. There's a focus on nutrient density. If I have patients who, when I present this way of eating to them, the, their eyes roll to the back of their head and I can tell that they're just like checked out, hard pass, this is not for them, there is a strategy that is a nice short-term hack, which is to use something like, it can be coconut oil, it can be sunflower seed butter, it can be, um, or sunflower butter, it can be um, ghee, it can be almond butter, but basically to take a spoonful of something like that either pure fat or fat and protein, and to do that at regular intervals. Some of my patients do that right before they brush their teeth at night and perhaps like in the early afternoon or right before they're about to head out of the home where they're not sure when their next meal is going to be. And that can give you this safety net of stable blood sugar, and it can blunt any crash that might be superimposed over it. And hopefully with a situation like that, they can start to feel a little bit better and maybe get tuned into the fact that diet is playing a bigger role here and, and evolve the diet over time. 
Don't give out my secrets. Yes, I'm playing the long game always. And I want people to have that felt experience of this helped. Now I feel better. Now bigger changes that might be necessary for my overall well-being be- feel more within reach. The other thing you touched on there is inflammation. And this ties to diet as well. A lot of these are going to interconnect and overlap. When it comes to inflammation, specifically somebody suffering with a mental health challenge, specifically anxiety, talk about the role that plays. Yeah, I think that there's a little like silent revolution happening right now in these outskirts of a functional medicine approach to mental health, which is recognizing the role that inflammation plays in so many of our chronic mental health issues. And, you know, we've all come of age being indoctrinated with the monoamine hypothesis of things like depression. In other words, our depression is our serotonin. And I'm not here to say serotonin is irrelevant. I think it's absolutely relevant. But sometimes changes in our serotonin function might be a downstream effect and not the original source of the problem. Where we do see a lot of interesting data is something called the cytokine hypothesis of depression or the inflammatory hypothesis. And so basically, if you look at the evolutionary precedent for what it meant to be inflamed. You were on the proverbial savanna of evolution, you were exposed to a microbe, and you're acutely inflamed. And it makes sense in that scenario to want to retreat, to not want to socialize, to go to your dark cave and rest until your immune system has gotten a foothold on this infection. And that works really well when the issue is a microbe. And it's very lousy when the issue is Doritos. And then Our immune system's not so good at fighting off Doritos. In fact, we get reinfected with every snack. And so what's happening in modern life is a lot of us are in a state of chronic low-grade inflammation from our processed foods and other exposures of modern life. And that puts us in a state of basically chronic low-grade depression because those symptoms line up pretty perfectly. Malaise, fatigue, wanting to isolate socially, wanting to retreat and stay in bed all day. That makes sense if we're acutely inflamed from a microbe, and it just makes our lives pretty unfulfilling if we're inflamed from processed foods and other exposures. And isn't there a theory out there that the effectiveness of SSRIs is actually coming from their anti-inflammatory benefits? That is a theory, yeah. If we can't even say they're effective, and I think that that's itself um, a much more complicated story than what we've been told. And for some people, it's undeniable. They absolutely are effective. Sometimes it's more of a placebo benefit that can fade over time. Um, Sometimes people really, it's not the right fit for their neurochemistry and it's never helpful. And so I always have to be really careful when I navigate the nuances and the vagaries of psych meds. So I'm a psychiatrist and I do prescribe medication. And there are times when it's a bridge that saves somebody. It allows them to crawl out of a deep hole and access these diet and lifestyle strategies that I think actually create a long-term plan for health. But I have so many patients for whom meds haven't been sufficiently effective. And so I'm offering alternatives for those folks. You know, if meds work for you, that's great. But if meds haven't worked for you, I just want those folks to know that there's still hope and there's still a lot that we can do. And if somebody is in a situation listening or watching right now and feeling like they are on meds, they're not working for me, I want to cycle off these in a healthy way. Obviously, you want to get help from a psychiatrist and not from a podcast, but to get people started in thinking about it, because you do dedicate part of your book to writing on this. Let's give people a heads up what that might look like and what is happening with these drugs where people are getting on them and then their body is just starting to rely on it. And it's, it's very hard to come off. This is a big problem. I mean, the chapter I write about it, I, I call it the silent epidemic. And what I see in my practice is that um, people are on their meds and maybe they think they haven't been that effective or for one reason or another, they want to get off. Maybe there's a contraindication, maybe there are side effects. And then they don't get support from their practitioner. And I, I understand because I've gone through medical school and psychiatry residency. The reason practitioners aren't supportive is that we are not taught how to be supportive of this. We aren't taught how to get people safely off of psych meds. We're really only taught how to start them and um, and then how to increase the dose when they're not effective. And and then it's sort of, there's a lot of complexity to this. It's It's a liability to take patients off because some patients really do struggle and it can get pretty dark. And what psychiatrist wants to create that problem? So instead we think, let's just continue the med. And so patients are left with doors closing in their faces. No one wants to help them get off, so they do it on their own. Often, they, if they taper at all, it's too rapid, 
and it, sometimes it's just cold turkey, and then they get thrown into withdrawal. But people don't know to identify this state as withdrawal. So they call it relapse and they say, okay, I guess this medication really was helping me. Um, I guess I needed it. I didn't realize how much it was helping me, but look how terrible I feel off of it. But that's actually not an accurate assessment of how somebody feels off of a med. That's how somebody feels in acute withdrawal from a psychoactive substance. And um, so I think we need to start identifying that it is withdrawal, that there are safer ways to taper off. It's usually just so much more gradually. I take months, sometimes years to get patients off of psychiatric medications. And I think that it's important to just clarify one concept. It's not to say that these are addictive. You know, they're not like rewarding and we don't get high from psych meds if only, right? But um, they, they do create physiologic dependence. So it's not so much that it's positively reinforcing to take it, but it does throw our physiology off to discontinue it. And that's an important clarification. And that's part of why so many people are struggling in silence, um, sometimes ashamed, really without finding any resource for support as they try to get off of psych meds. So I did my best to try to attempt to address that problem in the book, but it really warrants its own whole book and to be working with a practitioner who's knowledgeable and supportive. Yeah, but it's an important start and it gets people thinking about that option if that's right for them. Exactly. Let's talk more about the physiology. Obviously, there's different drugs out there. It's hard really to narrow it down. But in a general sense, when somebody becomes, you know, not addicted, but again, they're, I guess, addicted because their body does have withdrawal symptoms as they're coming off. What is the physiology? What's happening with that drug and its impact on the body to cause that? Um, it varies with all the different medications. Um, take the benzodiazepines, for example. That's one of the most hairy withdrawals that I work with. Um, so the benzodiazepines, or some people refer to them, I don't know if affectionately, as benzos. <laughs> and that's clonopin, Xanax, Ativan, Ativan, Valium. Um, these medications rush our brain with a neurotransmitter called GABA. And we talk a lot about serotonin. We don't ever talk about GABA. It, it's time is coming. It's a very important neurotransmitter when it comes to anxiety. Um, and basically, it's our primary inhibitory neurotransmitter of our central nervous system. Translation, it's the neurotransmitter that says, you're okay. Everything's going to be okay. If we hear a rustle in the leaves, GABA helps us know that's just the wind in the leaves. It's not a leopard. And when we drink alcohol, when we take a Xanax, we get a rush of GABA in our brain and that feels good. This is everything that we were so worried about a minute ago. Am I awkward? Social anxiety? Is there a leopard? It all just falls away. It's a nice warm hug. But our brain is not that wired for relaxation. It's wired for survival and it wants to restore homeostasis because it worries that if a leopard were to come around the corner in that moment, we'd be too buzzed to care and we wouldn't survive. So instead what happens is it, it makes attempts at reclaiming homeostasis. It happens differently between alcohol and the benzos. With benzos, it actually starts to pull our GABA receptors. So then what happens, I believe it's the GABA-A receptor in the brain. So then what happens is once the clonopin or the Xanax has washed out of your system and you're just back to having normal GABA levels in the brain, you don't have as many receptors. So it's almost like you effectively have lower levels of GABA in your brain. You, you effectively can't hear the GABA because you don't have the receptors. And that feels like the opposite of that warm hug. It feels like nothing is okay. And suddenly you find yourself irritable, unable to sleep, unable to arrive at a state of calm. You can't be comfortable in your own skin. Um, you can get into a ruminative spiral. You can have a panic attack. And these are the, the, some of the states that people get into when they're in benzodiazepine withdrawal. It can also be potentially lethal because GABA is also involved with um, inhibiting even something like seizure behavior. So it's there, there are dangers to getting off of benzos, and it's not something to do without physician support. It's not something to do um, suddenly. And, and basically what happens there is that we're just in this state of relative GABA withdrawal, and it feels terrible. And so part of the way I support that in my practice is I'll, I'll have patients go much more slowly and the whole process, we're supporting their natural GABA activity in their brain to make sure that it's a little bit of a softer landing. 
Well, let's get into what that looks like. Let's pull the veil off GABA and talk about for somebody who is either, you know, tapering off a drug. Again, they need help. They can't do this on their own from listening here. But for somebody who maybe has some anxiety and they want to just up that GABA in a natural way, what are some things people can do? Yeah, I think about it as mainly nutrition, rest, and time. And there's other things to do that are sort of adjacent, GABA adjacent, like supporting vagal tone. So you can support vagal tone with cold water plunging or cold showers or a meditation or breath work practice. You can do it humming, gargling. There's all these different ways to support vagal tone. That's GABA adjacent. It's sort of another way to create relaxation in the body. But in terms of supporting GABA receptors or the synthesis of GABA, um, actually a healthy gut flora plays a role. Believe it or not, there are certain bacteroidy species of gut bacteria that are involved with manufacturing GABA. So you do want to make sure you have a healthy gut. You have a diverse ecosystem of beneficial bacteria that might involve treating SIBO. It might involve, which to define it, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It might involve consuming fermented foods paired with starchy tubers to colonize the gut with these beneficial species. Um, and then nutrition in general, like this is building. It's We need the raw materials for rebuilding receptors. And so having a really nutrient-dense diet opening up to things like organ meats, egg yolks, all of the things that are kind of mother nature's multivitamins. And then rest because our body really only does its repair work when we're at rest and modern life is like anathema to rest. So we actually need to do less. We actually need to prioritize early bedtime and good quality sleep. Um, we need to give our body the the signal of now we're in a repair state of mind. When we're in a stress response, our body wisely triages the housekeeping and says, we will do that later. Right now, we're facing a saber-toothed tiger. Later, we will do the rebuilding of the GABA receptors if we're stressed. If we can convince our body that we are in a state of rest and relaxation, now is a good time to do the spring cleaning and the housekeeping, then our body gets into the repair mode. And tincture of time really does matter. And I think that that's where I come in as almost a midwife as people get off of meds, it can be really difficult. There's a lot of recapitulation of emotions that comes up. And I try to be there and supporting and, and letting somebody know it's not always going to feel like this and you can do it. And um, because it can be really uncomfortable while the brain re-equilibrates. Let's come back to the vagal tone piece. You described a lot of different ways there that we can work on that. But let's talk about the vagus nerve and why this is important. Yeah, it's so central. Um, part of what I'm most excited about with where the conversation is getting to around the vagus nerve right now is that, I mean, it's our most important cranial nerve, in my opinion. It's our longest one. It's winding through the whole body. It's innervating all of the visceral organs of our abdomen, our thorax, our pelvic cavity. It's It's the thing that tells our body to relax when we're relaxed. But importantly and interestingly, it's also the thing that reports to our brain about the state of affairs in the rest of the body. So that's the part of the conversation we haven't been having enough yet. We know the top-down communication. We've started to culturally appreciate that if we're stressed, if we're anxious, if we're cramming for something we're nervous about, we might have IBS, we might have diarrhea, we're going to have a nervous stomach. But what we haven't been appreciating is that if our gut is out of balance, for any number of reasons. And modern life makes a broad assault on the health of our digestive tract. So maybe we took antibiotics, maybe we ate something inflammatory, maybe we ate canola oil, um, maybe we're just chronically stressed. But well, that actually muddles the argument. So let's just say maybe we ate something inflammatory or we took antibiotics. So then what happens is that our gut is unwell and that sends information up along the vagus nerve back up to the brain and says, things are not okay down here, feel uneasy, so that we'll rest, so that we'll be motivated to make different choices. And so the critical learning around the vagus nerve is that it's bi-directional information, and it's actually majority afferent, meaning it's telling the brain about the state of the body. And I find that to be so exciting, because convincing our brain to be relaxed is like, a lifelong pursuit. But getting our gut back into a state of health can take a month, a few months. Um, and we can then tell our brain, be relaxed by way of the body. And it's often a more straightforward and effective and efficient path. 
to arriving at a state of well-being. So before when you talked about different modalities, such as I think you said humming, gargling, different things to improve the vagal tone, plus the piece you just gave us there, it sounds like it was improving the microbiome. You're kind of, it seemed like you're hinting at that. So for somebody to get that communication back up to the brain from the body functioning optimally, is it both of those pieces together? It's all of these pieces, right? So we're approaching it in all of these ways. Um, you can sort of, what we're trying to do is um, put the vagus nerve into a state of relaxation. So it's tracking up to the brain and saying, hey, by Jove, I never thought I'd say this, but the organism is relaxed. Another technique is, is breath work. And part of what's so interesting about breath work is that if we were genuinely relaxed, we might breathe in such a way where we're having deep diaphragmatic breaths, where our exhale is slightly longer than our inhale. And who among us is ever genuinely relaxed enough to breathe in that way? But if we just do 30 seconds of a breathing exercise, maybe we do the four, seven, eight breath, inhale to the count of four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. It can trick this gullible brain. It tracks a message up along the vagus nerve that says, well, I never thought I'd say this, but the organism is relaxed. It's breathing like a relaxed person. And then the neurohormonal cascade of relaxation ensues. So basically what we're trying to do is create the conditions in the physical body of relaxation so that the vagus nerve will send a transmission to the brain that we're relaxed and it has a kind of virtuous cycle of a relaxation response that it can induce. Another thing I found really interesting in your book that I'd like to talk to, it fits in with what we're getting into here, is using the body as a tool to release stress from the body. And you talked about something in your book that I actually went and downloaded the track, the shamanic shaking. Yeah. This is something that's not often talked about, using the body as a tool to, I'll let you get into the details, but to relieve stress. Talk more about that. Yeah. So that track of music, for anyone curious about it, is called Ama Extended Mix by James Asher. I think the album is Drums on Fire. And he's an incredible musician and a really just lovely heart of gold guy. Um, but the idea here, I learned this technique when I studied integrative medicine um, in Andy Weil's program down at the University of Arizona. And basically, part of what we need to do is what well, we need to acknowledge on the shoulders of Bessel van der Kolk and his book, The Body Could Keeps the Score, we hold a lot of our trauma and a lot of our stress, not in the brain or the memories, but in the physical body. It's in our connective tissues. This is where it held, it's held. This is where it lives. And this is the level at which we need to release it. And that's true on a lifelong capital T trauma basis, but it's also true in a, in a very small day-to-day -day way. We're holding all this stress. And we have these new insights around the stress response that it, it's really a cycle. Stress is a cycle. It's not unlike the arousal cycle. Like it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But the way we lead our lives... We're just stuck in arrested development. We have our beginning and a middle, and we have not brought our stress to resolution. When you look at animals in the animal kingdom, if they face an acute life or death stressor, afterward, they have some process for discharging that stress. They shake. They flap their wings in a vigorous way. Um, they have some way of resetting, pressing control, alt, delete, and it discharges the excess adrenaline. It tells the nervous system the threat has passed. And that's the part we're missing as socialized human creatures. Because if you walk down the street and you trip, you're not going to shake it out for a minute. You're going to be like, nothing to see here. Totally be cool. Just keep walking. And that's a microcosm of what we do all the time in our lives. Just be cool. Nothing to see here. Keep it under control. Stay stoic and emotionally even. But instead, what we want to do is when our body needs a release, we want to give ourselves that release. That could be crying. That could be shaking. It could be dancing, chanting, singing, journaling, um, cuddling, playing with a pet or a baby, um, something that tells our nervous system the threat has passed, it's now safe to be in my body, and ideally something that excavates whatever gets stuck and lodged in our tissues. So shamanic shaking is my favorite. It's so efficient and it's so pleasant, and I have never gotten bored of that one track of music. I've done it now for, I think, over 10 years. And I basically put it on for a minute or two in between patients when I need to reset and kind of just clear whatever I took on from the former patient. And I'll just close my eyes, let my body be kind of floppy like a rag doll and shake. And importantly, I don't move the way that would look cool or even normal. 
I move however my body feels like moving. And that itself is um, a pretty reparative relationship to be in with our bodies, to listen to what it needs and to honor that. I'm sure a lot of us have never even done that. Ever. Our world doesn't make it easy. I want to get into true anxiety, but before we do, let's stick on false a little bit more and talk about some of these other factors. So when you're working with somebody, what are some of the other things you like to look at and address? So really common false anxieties that I see in my practice. We talked about blood sugar. That's a big one. Um, I don't know how many full-on panic disorders have just been solved with that intervention alone. Um, for other people, it, I look at diet a lot. Diet is fraught these days. You know, it's the stuff of tribal warfare on the internet, and we can get into that or not. But, but basically, I think for some people, they need more nourishment. They might be walking around overfed but undernourished, and their nervous system feels that. We need the raw materials to have a healthy, functioning nervous system. So sometimes we need more vitamin B12 or folate or zinc. Um, sometimes omega-3 fatty acids. Sometimes I wouldn't even say I can point to a specific nutrient. Someone just needs the signal of enough in their body so that their brain can relax. Other people, it's really more about removing what's inflaming their system. So that could be gluten or dairy. It could be the seed oils. Um, it could be something subtle and random for somebody if they had a, some kind of idiosyncratic food intolerance. And then I do... I do look a lot at sleep. That is a really nice place to start because, you know, people don't necessarily want to get off coffee or alcohol. That's like we're playing the long game with those. But sleep, everybody wants to sleep well and it feels good and it's free, but it eludes so many of us. So a big focus of how I approach false anxiety is to really think about not just convincing. We don't need to convince people anymore to prioritize sleep. Now it's about troubleshooting what's getting in the way. And I think more than anything else, it has to do with light. And so I have a prop. <laughs> I will have most of my patients get some kind of blue blocking glasses and put them on at sunset and wear them till bedtime. It doesn't have to be the ones I'm wearing right now, which look like you're about to go do metallurgy or fly fishing. You can get the ones that look relatively normal. But basically, most people need to be a little more conscious of the blue spectrum light that they're seeing after sunset. This is something your audience, I think, is very familiar with at this point. Um, but that one's a big one because our whole circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle, is cued by light. And that was actually a good design on the proverbial savanna of evolution. If it was light out, it was by definition daytime. And when it was nighttime, it was by definition dark. And the whole script has been flipped in modern life. So our poor brain that's just trying to do its best, our suprachiasmatic nucleus, that sort of internal clock that we have that's scanning the landscape for light cues, it's seeing our phone screen at 11 p.m. and it's thinking, oh, okay, I thought I was tired, but apparently the sun is rising. So suppress melatonin, cue cortisol, let's feel wide awake. And that's why so many of us are tired but wired in the evening and find it hard to fall asleep and stay asleep. And um, I'll also encourage people to not bring the phone into the bedroom at night, to not have it on their bedside table. That intervention alone decreases blue spectrum light, so it protects the circadian rhythm. But also, we're living in the attention economy, and that has so many implications for false anxiety. But basically, every app is designed with no natural stopping point, so we'll scroll endlessly. No one has ever said, look, got to the end of TikTok. Let me put my phone to the side and go to sleep with this wholesome hour. And so that's another way that I'll support sleep. Um, I mentioned a moment ago, caffeine and alcohol. That's a tough conversation. That's never where I start. People don't love that conversation, but there are very real physiologic reasons that for some people, caffeine can be an anxiogenic drug in their system. Um, and for most of us, alcohol we just want to be conscious in how it's playing a role in our overall mental health. And if we can come to it eyes wide open from a self-loving place and say, right now in this moment, this glass of wine is the act of radical self-love, you have my blessing. But I just want us to be reflecting on it. Just like the benzos, alcohol rushes the brain with GABA. It's why we like it. But in the case of alcohol, the brain converts that GABA into a different neurotransmitter called glutamate. 
And that's an excitatory neurotransmitter. And that's why after a night of drinking, we wake up at 3 a.m. with that vague, headachey, uneasy feeling, and we toss and turn with our thoughts racing, and we feel irritable the whole rest of the next day and just think, when am I going to get to have another drink? And so alcohol is another factor with anxiety. Another area I was excited to see you write about is the birth control pill. Yes. We talked about drugs before, but we didn't get into this. So for the females out there who are suffering from anxiety, Talk about what you see with that in practice. Yeah. So I'll acknowledge that from a public health perspective and a sort of female rights perspective, um, easy, accessible forms of contraception is a win. This is a great thing. On an individual level, we just need to be aware of how it works with our system. And some people do great with the pill. Some people actually find that it supports their mood and their anxiety levels. It improves it. But I've had a lot of patients over the years where when we track back through their mental health history, their entire relationship to having mental health issues began basically a month or two after they started the pill. And I've just seen this pattern too many times to ignore, where a woman went on the pill for one reason or another, and then... A couple months later, she reports to her gynecologist or her primary care doctor, you know, actually I'm feeling pretty weepy, kind of sad. Um, and they go on an antidepressant and then it sort of starts them down the whole path. Maybe the antidepressant causes sexual side effects. They add Wellbutrin. Now they're anxious. Now they're adding a benzo. Now they can't focus. They're adding a stimulant. Now they can't sleep. They're adding Ambien. And before you know it, you're on this cocktail of psychiatric medications. But it actually all started with the pill. And so when I meet patients where this is that that's the chronology of their mental health history, we chip away at it little by little. But usually when we get them off the pill and kind of clear the slate of all the other false anxieties, they actually aren't anxious or depressed anymore. It was really just how they felt on these exogenous hormones. And the fact that for so many years, women were going to their doctor and reporting that the pill made them feel weepy or made them feel anxious um, and they were being told there's no evidence for that. And of course, we know absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But it was a very gaslighting, dismissive, and validating thing that people were coming up against. Now, of course, we do have the evidence that corroborates what women subjectively have known for so long. And it makes me really sad and somewhat outraged to think about all of the unnecessary suffering that's happened. There were alternatives to contraception that might have not created all of these mental health struggles. And so for anyone who's had this path, you know, I just want them to be examining the role it might play and to trust their subjective experience and just to kind of apologize on behalf of the conventional medical system that might have invalidated somebody's concerns. And there are alternatives, and that's just important for everyone to know. In doing your research, have you come across any stats whether or not the use of the birth control pill is dropping or going up over the years? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know that there's definitely been, I mean, over the years, there's been an expansion to other options, but we should be really clear. We have this, you know, omnivorous panoply of options at this point, but a lot of them are still exogenous hormones. And that's what's really central to the mood changes, which for any menstruating woman, how could hormones not impact our mood? We know our mood changes through the course of our menstrual cycle. We know that it changes in the days before our period when our hormones drop away. So how could taking exogenous hormones not impact our mood? So the ring and um, injectables and the patch and the pill, these are all effectively the same. They're all exogenous hormones. There are two kinds of IUDs. There's the copper IUD, which is not a source of exogenous hormones, though it is a source of chronic low-grade inflammation in the womb. So maybe that's not ideal. Um, but I do think of that as a, you know, in a harm reduction strategy, one of the lesser evils, just because it's not a hormonal method. And um, But the progesterone-eluting IUDs like the Mirena, Skyla, those are exogenous hormones. It's different. It's not estrogen plus progesterone. It's just progestin, but it can still impact mood. Um, but these days, there is increased awareness of things like fertility awareness method, which is not a way of preventing STD transmission or STI transmission, I should say. Um, but it is um, a way, as long as somebody really takes it seriously and is educated about how to do it properly, it can be a very effective contraceptive method. And what about on the other end of the spectrum? As women get older and their hormones start to decline... There's a lot of women that get on exogenous hormones at that period of time in their life. 
do you find that when you're working with women in that age bracket and they're taking these hormones, that affects their anxiety at all? Yeah. Well, so perimenopausal phase of life and then postmenopausal phase of life, these have their own myriad ways that they impact our mood. And it's such a, it's a polyfactorial, but the hormonal changes themselves, especially in how they impact sleep, absolutely do impact anxiety levels. Um, so what I see, and I think I heard this on one of the episode of, of your podcast is actually, this is something very important that I think a lot about in my practice. The healthier we are going into perimenopause and menopause, sometimes the bit more tolerable the symptoms. So things like not being dysglycemic, making sure that we have metabolic flexibility, that helps as we head in. But there's just no avoiding the fact that a drop in hormones changes how we feel. And I'm always fascinated biologically for why it's impossible for it's impossible for us to adapt to menopause because it's by definition post-reproductive. So it's very hard to select for adaptations to menopause because, you know, say there was a lucky genetic mutation in one woman and she had a better menopause <laughs> than just when that makes her more fit, she is by definition not able to reproduce. So it's not going to select for more reproductive fitness. And so I just think it's interesting that this is sort of a little bit of a um, an oopsie of how evolution works is that we don't have a way of selecting for advantageous mutations to menopause. Um, very subtly, you know, the grandmother effect of being able to support uh, grandchildren and offspring down the road. But I think that overall, if I think societally, we have a large role to play in supporting this process in letting women recognize their own worth, even after, you know, not having such a focus on a woman's worth being associated with her fertility, her youth, her beauty, her beauty by these, you know, very limited patriarchal standards. Um, and I think that having a work life that can accommodate a slightly different sleep schedule, maybe you don't sleep as efficiently overnight. Perhaps there's a way to soften around the edges or create the space for a nap in the middle of the day. So I think if we as a society can give women a little grace and a little bit of spaciousness, um, I think that impacts how difficult this transition is. Ellen, throughout reading your book and our conversation, it's really apparent how deep you've gone into this alternative health realm and, and know for yourself and for your patients. And you talked about taking Dr. Wiles' program, and I know that's part of your training and part of the knowledge base that you have. But at this point, I'm curious, I want to get into your story and how you got into this alternative way of practicing. When did that start? Yeah, I think that um, there were these two parallel processes happening while I was a medical student. One was I was doing everything quote unquote right and everything was broken in my body. And so I, you know, I was eating skinless chicken breast and low fat dairy and soy milk and running. I mean, this was like the early 2000s, even the 90s, right? And yet I had polycystic ovary syndrome. I couldn't get my period. I had joint pain and the beginnings of autoimmune issues ocular migraines, acne. I was told I was infertile. I couldn't poop to save my life. Nothing was working. And I was like, what gives? This doesn't make sense. And I didn't have the vocabulary for it yet. I hadn't ever heard of functional medicine. I didn't understand the idea of root cause resolution rather than symptom suppression. But at least I had some spidey sense when I went into my gynecologist and I was like, I haven't gotten a period in six months. And she was like, oh, okay. And we did some labs. You have polycystic ovary syndrome. You'll probably struggle to get pregnant one day, but let's just put you on the pill and that'll fix things up. And I didn't know what I, I didn't know yet, but I knew like, hmm, it was a head scratcher for me. I was like, I think I'm the product of many generations of successful reproduction. Why did it stop with me? What's wrong here? And that was all happening in parallel with the fact that I was being trained how to heal people, but I witnessed right before my eyes that I was learning how to masterfully medicate them. But were they thriving? Were they walking out of my office and in stepping into a fulfilling life? And I was not convinced of that. I wasn't yet thinking maybe that I was, even sometimes I was thinking I was doing harm, which is sort of, you know, this first principle of practicing medicine, first do no harm. And I was, I, I was, it all felt a little shaky. And so in parallel, I was disenchanted with how I was being taught to help people. I was myself falling apart 
And I went on a very inefficient process of figuring out how to get myself into balance, how to support my patients. Those happened in tandem. And basically, I was a guinea pig in my own body. And what I would learn in my body, I would then apply to my patients. And that has continued, really. And it's incredibly fulfilling. I, I often think that I was even put on this earth to be a precious, precious snowflake that's genetically vulnerable to being poisoned by modern life so that I can identify what might get other people out of balance and help them figure out what's what's happening in their own bodies. The canary in the coal mine. Exactly. And it's interesting as you tell that story, you know, this picture I have of you going through medical school and having these health challenges and then, you know, having this epiphany and realizing you want to practice in a different way. It must have been such a challenging time for you to realize, you know, this education you were invested in and this model that you thought you'd be practicing for life was kind of shattering before your eyes, but you're kind of committed. And luckily you found a way out and still get to do the best of both worlds. But I can imagine going through that must have been really hard. You know, it's it was super hard for those reasons and a number of others. It's just grueling training, and I was so socially isolated and unmoored, and I just didn't understand how my life was going to shake out. But I think I do have a rare combination of being super rebellious, and I don't take anybody else's word, you know, at face value, and somehow like pretty square and people pleasing and likely to like jump through any hoop that someone puts before me. So that was the rare combo that got me through a decade of medical training while also um, rebelling against everything I was taught to believe. <laughs> so somehow that spits out on the other end, a holistic psychiatrist. I can imagine a lot of people tuning in today, learning about this other way psychiatry can be practiced. And I've had a previous guest who's a psychiatrist, Dr. Drew Ramsey on the show. So for somebody who is like, okay, I, I, I want to continue to get my, my mental health care if they're seeing a psychologist or psychiatrist, but I want somebody that thinks this way. Like how many people are out there practicing in this way and how do people go about finding them? Yeah, it's, it's can be tricky. Um, so there's a handful of folks taking, you know, varying forms of holistic approaches to mental health. And um, when a new one pops on the scene, I'm always so excited and I refer a million patients to them and then their practice fills up. So that happens over and over again. So sometimes it can be kind of discouraging. You feel like you don't find someone. If you can find someone who thinks about mental health differently or uses nutrition or uses mind-body practices, that's great. If you can't, um, there are ways of achieving a similar effect. Rather than pointing someone toward conventional psychiatrist, where it's pretty much going to be meds and CBT and a conventional view on things, I'd rather someone seek care with a naturopath or a functional medicine internist. Because part of my view on mental health is that start in the physical body. A lot of mental health is first physical imbalance. And, you know, maybe a naturopath isn't going to be as good as a therapist in getting you to the psycho-spiritual dimensions, though sometimes they're quite good at it. Um, but they can at least address all of the physical imbalance. And you're going to be sometimes 80% of the way there just with that intervention alone. So there are there's more abundance of naturopaths and functional medicine internists than holistic psychiatrists. So that's often a good alternative. And just really good therapy. Um, maybe someone trained in internal family systems or one of the trauma-focused therapies like somatic experiencing therapy or EMDR. These are other great ways to get um, just uh, make really good strides in terms of addressing potential root causes of imbalance. And we haven't even talked about trauma and the limbic system, but that's its own whole conversation. But if that's applicable for somebody listening, you'd want to work with a trauma-focused therapist who's really thinking about nervous system healing and working at the level of the limbic system to reprogram, to basically help take the foot off the accelerator pedal in our um, way of perceiving threat in our environment. Sometimes with early childhood trauma, we just get stuck in that. What was adaptive then, we're still stuck in that state in adulthood when it's become maladaptive. So there are ways to retrain the limbic system to not always perceive threat where there's not threat. Well, let's get deeper into that. That's a good topic to dig into. So for somebody who, you know, they're hearing this, their ears are perking up and they're like, okay, maybe I have an issue that needs to be addressed in this area. Let's talk about what the limbic system is and then what that kind of work can look like. 
Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, Bessel van der Kolk, he wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, and that's, you know, must-see TV. But basically, we we think, you know, our instinct would be that if we're traumatized, we need to go to a therapist and talk about it and hash and rehash and process out loud. And it turns out not only is that not always effective, but it can even be re-traumatizing. And our trauma is not something we need to consciously figure out. It is something that is held in the body. It's held in our connective tissues. It's certainly held in how our limbic system gets stuck in a gear. And that's the level at which we need to intervene. And so you want to work with someone who's enlightened about that. And that's the somatic experiencing therapist, someone who's doing EMDR, um, internal family systems can be great for that. And also, I really like sending patients to something called DNRS, which I believe stands for Dynamic Neural Retraining System. And that is a kind of DIY approach to doing trauma-focused therapy. You know, you're not working individually with a therapist necessarily, but it teaches you a way of taking yourself through this therapy on a daily basis. And that is what I've witnessed has been most effective for my patients who carry trauma. And the limbic system, I mean, it's really where we're processing emotions. And within that, we have our amygdala, which we kind of colloquially call it our fear detection center. It's more complicated than that. It's really keenly intertwined with emotions, but basically it is scanning the landscape for a potential threat. And if it sees a squiggle on the floor, it's our amygdala. It's like, is it a snake? And it turns out that it's influenced by our experiences and it's influenced by our mood in that moment. And in biostatistics and in research, we have this concept of positive predictive value. Like if you study a population, it are, you know, how many people are going to have a certain condition? Well, like if they're all smokers, there might be, might be more likely that they might have a certain condition if you're looking sort of like if it's oncology research. And an amygdala of a person who's been through trauma, any squiggle it sees on the floor, it almost has a higher positive predictive value. It thinks things are going to be threatening because of what it's been through. And so it's really perceiving the landscape with a bias towards threat. And that makes it really hard to go through life, especially if you've worked really hard to get yourself into a safer situation, but you can't relax into it. And so that's why you want to intervene at the level of the limbic system and start to reprogram it to not constantly perceive threat, to start to recognize when it's indeed safe. And when somebody has an issue and they're doing this kind of work, does this relate to true anxiety or is that totally different? I, any, any nomenclature system always has its breakdown, you know, and trauma I think is um, something that doesn't perfectly fit into my classification system of true and false. It's certainly more true in that this is our makeup, it's our wiring. Sometimes it's trauma we've experienced and sometimes it's really something we need to honor. Sometimes it's from our ancestors. And the fact that that's even a question tells me people haven't learned about epigenetics, right? But what our ancestors have gone through is in a very material, physical way embedded through methylation in our DNA. If we're, if, you know, like basically we were a follicle in the ovaries of our mom as a fetus when our grandmother, our maternal grandmother was pregnant with her. So we've been on this planet for a long time in some DNA form. And whatever our maternal grandmother was going through impacted her own DNA, but also the follicle DNA in our mom as a fetus. And so we were ourselves the eggs inside her fetal ovary. And so basically what our ancestors have gone through is also impacting us. And it's a beautiful way that genes have of adapting to the environment. They basically say, is this an unsafe world? Then methylate to be prepared for an unsafe world. Is this a, f a world with food scarcity? Then methylate to be prepared for food scarcity. Be more inclined to carry excess weight to have a stronger appetite. And so it's a, it's a, it's a nice design that we adapt to our environment but we do sometimes carry a heavy burden of what our ancestors have gone through. And so I think that there's work we can do to unpack that. But I think most of all, we need to tell our ancestors stories. We need to honor what they went through. We need to be aware of them and think about them and even talk to them and recognize that it's part of what makes us who we are. It sounds like we all have a lot of work to do. 
Yeah, but it's beautiful. It's the human experience. While we're on that, let's talk about the work. For somebody who's thinking like, okay, this is great. I have some new goals, some new things I can dig into, completely heal myself, and then move on with life. Talk about how this, you know, you know, being human, it's an imperfect thing and it's always a journey because I think people need to have a realistic goal when they get into the work of what it's going to look like and that the work is ongoing. Yeah. So I can't help but what comes to my mind first is to sort of use my own experience with this as an example, but I've also witnessed this with countless patients at this point. But when I was in my 20s, I was so out of balance. I was so unwell that I really needed to chip away at my false anxiety first. And so that had to be kind of a part-time job. And it was front and center of my awareness. I had to become less inflamed. I actually had to get off the birth control pill, it turns out. I had to get off of gluten. Um, I needed to do a lot of gut healing. I needed to figure out how to sleep, all of these things. And then it got to a point where this is for me the goal with so many of my patients is health, optimal health is not in and of itself our goal. It just needs to be a foundation so we can go forth and lead our fulfilling lives, make our contribution to this world. And so you want to get to the point where your health is just good enough that it can recede into the background. It just serves as a foundation. You have vitality, you have the energy, you have the clarity that you can engage and lock in to what this life is. But once you're at that point, there's a maintenance mode to it. Like I didn't arrive at a state of health and then it's like, let the pizza binging begin. You know, it's like now I, I eat in a particular way that keeps me in balance, but there's a little more wiggle room. Sometimes the act of radical self-love is eating the sweet potatoes and the grass-fed steak. And sometimes the act of radical self-love is having the croissant once every year and a half. And oh, that sounds sad. Let's say every six months. And so basically that's me and my sensitivity to gluten. But then there's the other aspect of maintenance mode, which is that we have to be rolling with our emotions. Being a human being on this planet is heavy. There's a lot that we go through. There's an immense vulnerability to loving and having connection to other physical beings that we might lose at some point. And there's hardship, there's loss. And so then we need to be in the rhythm of crying and feeling our emotions and processing them. Um, gratitude and feeling our ecstasy and our joy and actually being awake for that, putting our phones away so that we're actually here having this experience and not distracted. And I think that we also, we need to be giving ourselves permission to seek and ask the bigger questions. Because if we're just myopically looking at life as, let me heal my physical body and then I can focus on my mortgage and my taxes, like, what's it all for? I think there might be something vastly beyond our comprehension occurring here. And I don't have the answer, but I give myself a lot of permission to explore those questions, and just to live the questions. And sometimes I find that some things feel true to me, and that gives me a lot of comfort, you know, where I find magic or where I find um, some kind of spiritual resonance in this life. And so I think that once health is solved for, it really opens up the possibilities of what's going to be your version of a fulfilling life. Well, you talked about something there I want to probe a little bit deeper into, and that's feeling the feelings, whether that be gratitude, whether that be the feelings that we don't want to feel, the uncomfortable feelings. This is an important piece for people that they get to the point when they can sit with feelings and process them and not just turn to social media or turn to work because, again, well, not again, but a lot of us these days are, are in jobs, working from home where there's always a computer to flip open or a phone to open up and, and, and work to be done. So putting the distractions away and truly feeling the feelings, I'd love for you to talk on that and the importance. Yeah. I mean, first of all, no judgment or shame here. We've all come of age in this emotion phobic culture that has been telling us throughout our lives. Um, here's what we value, that you be chill, that you be stoic, emotionally even. And if you cry, we know to apologize. We feel like a burden on the people around us. It makes other people squirm and uncomfortable. So it's like, okay, you know, noted, crying, not good. 
And if we're very sensitive, people say, don't be so sensitive. If we're very emotional, you know, people roll their eyes at it. And so we get all this conditioning throughout our lives to slurp it all inside, <laughs> hold it on lockdown. And so here we are in 2022, and now we've had our patron saints of vulnerability like Brene Brown come forth, and we've had um, Glennon Doyle come forth, and they're kind of all helping to advance um, the collective understanding of how to be in dynamic with our relation, with our emotions. And um, I think that it's a different journey for all of us, but it starts with permission. And I think a little bit of trusting that we can handle our emotions. And there's a really nice analogy in Chinese medicine of a bamboo tree. And the idea is that, like, be flexible like a bamboo tree. Sway in the wind. If the wind takes you towards ecstasy, anger, sadness, grief, rage, let it sway, but also come back to your center. And I think to just trust that that's how we can flow with our emotions, that we can go deeply into something. And it's, it's actually, and this is the counterintuitive part, it's actually in resisting our emotions and strong arming it or trying to suppress it. That's where we get stuck and entrenched. This is the psychiatrist's insight. Um, we think that we're going to have less of that emotion if we resist it human emotions, it's its a quantity of energy. There's conservation of mass here. No human emotion has ever been successfully pushed under the rug. It doesn't go away. If anything, it just gets lodged. It transmutes into chronic headaches and chronic back pain and digestive issues. I think it behooves us to just feel it in the first place and know that we can handle it. It's a lot like a wave. It crests. It feels like a tidal wave. It overwhelms us. We think, I will not survive this. And then like any wave, it ultimately resolves and we bobble back to the surface. And so to kind of understand that it feels like a very big emotion, it, it feels like it turns us upside down. We don't know which way is up when we're really in it. But going through that a number of times, we experience self-efficacy that we can handle our emotions, we can flow with it. And actually overall, we feel a lot more resilient when we do let ourselves flow into our emotions. And when people go through what we've been talking about today and, and make a lot of the lifestyle diet changes, check off the bo boxes for the false anxiety, is what we're talking about now, the true anxiety, the deeper emotions that are still there once we've done that other work and we get our health in a good place? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit of all of it, right? Like you can be full of false anxieties and you need to give yourself an outlet for crying. You know, so I think that before you've fixed all your false anxieties, we still need our emotional outlets. We need to flow with it because there's real emotion to those falsely derived moods. And, but then once we've cleared the air and we're still feeling big emotions, it's certainly our body's way of communicating. There's something to look at here. And, or maybe sometimes at the very least, just something to be with here. We don't necessarily need to verbally make sense of it or, um, arrive at some conclusion of what that was, sometimes we just need to feel it and let it metabolize. I have a lot of times where, um, like I always find it's in my late luteal phase, the days before my period, which have a false anxiety quality to it and a true anxiety quality to it. It's kind of this truth serum time where your tolerance for BS is lower and what's not right in your life and the world, you just have a enhanced ability to be irritated by it. And, um, I'll have a lot of vague emotions passing through me. And sometimes I know what they're about. And sometimes I feel like I want to talk about them. So I'll be like, I'll say to my partner, like, I want to process this with you. But other times it just feels like this little unit of emotion that needs to flow through me. And I never really know what it's about. And I just let it flow. And so we also need to be okay with like, sometimes you just stay with it, let it move, kind of witness it going by. Like, that was that. And then be like, okay. <laughs> that worked through. And I think that there's a true anxiety quality, even if we don't know the meaning of something. It's just something that our sweet little bodies are moving through as we go about the heaviness of this human life. But when it comes to true anxieties, there will be times that certain patterns are going to come up again and again. And that's when we can use that as a compass to figure out that there's deeper work to do there. Absolutely. And thank you for reining that in. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, when there's a pattern, when there is something consistent coming through, that's our body sometimes whispering, sometimes if it's been ignored systemically long enough, 
um, sometimes shouting at us, pay attention to this. You know that something's not okay here. And it can be something very local, really in our personal lives. It can be, you know, as we talked about earlier, like that we are in the wrong job or the wrong relationship or we need to call our grandma more often. But it can also be a little nudge of, you know that there's some wrong in the world that you bring a unique perspective to and you need to step up into a role of helping write the course correct the whole on a larger level. And so I think that when there's a theme to our emotions, when there's a theme to our anxiety, we really want to pay attention to it. And that's really tough in modern life because modern life is constantly dazzling and distracting us and saying, why would you be with your emotion when you can watch the next thing that pops up on YouTube or you can keep scrolling Instagram or TikTok? And I think it requires a lot of very proactive, um, uh, we, we need to, to choose to stay with our true anxiety and to stay curious about it and willing to sit in the middle of the storm until we really understand what it's asking of us. One area you get into in the book that I want to discuss is plant medicines. And I can see how this could tie into this whole conversation about, you know, having certain themes come up and, and, and taking time to really process things because that's what a plant medicine is going to do. It's going to give you that time and that space and that, that specific headspace to have certain things come up and to work through things. So I know part of your journey is, is you've used these plant medicines as a tool for yourself. And I know some of your patients have as well. So I'd love for you to talk about how they've been helpful to you and to, to others. Yeah. So plant medicines, all the caveats apply, you know, they, and I don't say this just as a medical, legally nervous, like, um, check the box. I really mean it. Like, if someone has a chaotic brain, if they have a tendency towards psychosis or mania, I don't necessarily think that plant medicines are advisable. I think that it can pour gas on the fire sometimes. But for anyone who has more of an entrenched or rigid or stuck brain pattern, um, then they can be pretty transformative. And in in psychoanalysis, like Freudian psychoanalysis, you talk about dreams being the royal road to the unconscious. And I kind of think psychedelics and plant medicines are this divine hotline. You know, it takes you right into um, what your unconscious secretly knows. It can sometimes feel like it's a download from within. It can sometimes feel like it's a download from some, you know, it can be some noetic sense of I just know this now. It feels almost like it's handed to you from on high. But the reasons that psychedelics work are really interesting. And, you know, we now have pretty airtight evidence that they're very effective in things like end-of-life angst and for depression, and they're being investigated for substance abuse, opiate dependence, um, anorexia nervosa, really interesting indications, um, and they're very promising. Part of it is familiar. You know, they're, they're anti-inflammatory. They are active on the serotonergic system. Like we recognize this from our other treatments. But part of it is pretty new and interesting, and I think kind of speaks to what ails us as human beings in this moment. And one aspect of how they're effective is, well, there's the brain-derived neurofa- neurotrophic factor f- aspect. So they help us be more neuroplastic. And that just means like we can grow, we can change, we can adapt, we can reframe. As a psychiatrist, I salivate at that, right? So someone can go work with plant medicines and then come back to therapy with me and we just get so much more mileage from any given therapeutic intervention at that point. But part of the reason they're effective is their effect on the default mode network. And this is this part of our brain where we hang out when we're future tripping or dwelling on the past. And it's where we have our narrow sense of ourself an ego separate from others. And to quiet that down for the duration of a plant ceremony is really profound because you can dissolve this sense of ourself as separate from others. We can feel a much broader sense of interconnection. Like what matters to us is not just our ego, not just the limitations of our self, but maybe our community maybe all sentient beings, maybe the universe. And so we can really broaden what matters to us, what we're willing to fight for. And the part that I'm most excited about, about why psychedelics seem to be effective, is what's called the mystical experience hypothesis, which is basically to say that the more the peak mystical experience that you have in a psychedelic ceremony, 
the more uh, it, it correlates with the antidepressant effect. And so it's not just this chemical that you put in your brain and then you feel less depressed afterward. It's the experience itself. It's the journey that you go on and what you witness and experience while in that ceremony that impacts whether or not it's going to be effective for you. And if it creates a sense of a peak mystical experience, ah, feeling guided or loved or connected, then it's more effective. And that's why I'm most excited. I think about what my colleague said, his name is Will Sue, and he's like, psychedelics are not just tools for healing trauma. They're agents for making spirituality palatable to our starving Western world. And that's, I think, you know, it's certainly where I culminate in my book is this exploration of, is part of the reason we're so anxious right now that we have really lost connection with spirituality. And I'm not here to proselytize. There's no right or wrong to this. But I do think we need to at least give ourselves permission to explore and just to figure out what does feel true for us. And if that happens in a church, okay. And if it happens in a, in a the cathedral of the trees or when we're surfing or when we're singing in a choir or sitting in physics class, I, you know, it's all good. But to come back to a state of awe and wonder and even to be able to trust the unfolding of our lives is such a salve for our anxiety. It would be interesting to know, and maybe you have more insight on this, the use of psychedelics over the years, because the point we're at now where they're so stigmatized and the rise in mental health issues, you wonder if there's any correlation there that these have been tools and ally to us throughout the years that now has been stigmatized and blocked. Again, just just my curious mind. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's a great line of thinking. The lion's share of the history of use of psychedelics is, you know, it's not even the 1960s in the U.S. that ended in the sort of moral panic about the risks of these substances. It's really in um, traditional cultures that had, you know, long-standing, very reverent, sacred relationships to these medicines. So that's that's most of how these medicines have been part of human you know, have been in relationship with human brains. Um, And then we had this, you know, original psychedelic renaissance that um, (laughs) came to kind of a crashing, um, screeching halt. And so now we're in this new wave of it and researchers are handling and organizations like MAPS are handling it so judiciously and, and thinking really smartly about how to study this in a way that's ethical and tolerable to uh, a society that still has some residual moral panic about the substances. But I think that what you said makes me think of what one shaman said to me once, which was that they he was involved with ayahuasca in Peru for many years, and he was like, we were all about protecting it, keeping it secret, keeping it sacred, making sure that it didn't get bodlerized or um, sort of tainted by Western perspectives. So we kept it very secret. And he's like, and then at a certain point, the medicine started speaking to us. And ayahuasca basically said, I don't need you to protect me. You all need me to save you. And basically at that point, it's almost like these medicines spread like wildfire across the globe. And it's almost, and I do, I mean, this is where I'm at the very far reaches of where I still hold on to my objective scientific background. Like there is a part of me that thinks with things like psilocybin, which is um, a network of fungi that communicate with each other and things like ayahuasca. Like I do actually believe that these plants have in certain ways a different form of consciousness and that they thought enough is enough. And this planet needs healing. This species of human beings needs healing and we're going to show up for it. And so I think that they're recruiting an army right now. I think that they're, they're trying to influence us to quiet our default mode networks, to make us feel more interconnected with each other, with the earth, um, to expand our capacity for empathy and awe. And it makes me hopeful. I think that It's not for everyone. It's not a panacea. We still need to do the work. Just having a big, you know, tripping your balls off doesn't save the planet. (laughs) But I think that it's potentially a step that brings us in the right direction. So I do actually think it's happening at exactly the right moment. And one thing I want to highlight there, you talked about your patient and having a plant medicine ceremony or treatment and then coming back and doing therapy with you, the integration phase. 
So it's not just about having these one-off experiences and then life being at the snap of the fingers dramatically different. It's using that as a tool for, again, the right people and then doing the work afterwards, having the veil lifted by the medicine. I really do believe this, um, that like tip of the iceberg, 10% of the process is the big experience while you're under the influence of the medicine. 90% of the way that this can impact and transform your life is in the integration because it fades. Like you can have a huge revelation and then if you don't galvanize it in therapy and integration, talk about it, reflect on it, make it make sense to you, make it a part of your life, integrate it into your life and into your understanding of yourself it can just fizzle away. And so it's in therapy or in in integration that we actually leverage these experiences to change. And as somebody who has been through the experiences and the ceremonies yourself, do you feel like there's certain things that you've gotten from those that you wouldn't be able to get through other means? For me, I mean, anything's possible, but I wasn't going to get there from meditation personally. Some people really can and really do. Um, I'm certainly somebody that kind of benefits from the crutch of these medicines sending me into outer space. Like I don't get to that astral plane through meditation and breath work, and I'm just not disciplined enough to get there. Um, so I get there through these medicines. And then also, you know, I think it was Ramdas who said, when the conversation's over, hang up the phone. Like I also use the insights I've gotten from these medicines to know when to uh, fold, you know, when to, when to say like, it's, that's enough for right now. Let me work on this. Let me chew on this for many months, sometimes a year. Um, and then also the insights on these medicines help me know when it's time to reapproach. And so, yeah. Earlier, you talked about the croissant example and, you know, having that leniency within your diet, say every six months or a year to have that and, and, and getting a different benefit from that. And obviously there's a certain detriment, say, because you're gluten intolerant. Reminds me of something you talked about in the book where you said you'd, and I'm just paraphrasing here, you'd rather stay out late with a group of friends and eat all kinds of food you wouldn't normally eat or something along those lines to get that benefit of community. And I think this is a good way to come full circle with our conversation and end on this, the power of community as being a piece for people that are suffering. Yeah. Oh, Jesse, we can go a lot of directions with this. So I think I, you hear it say, I don't know who to attribute it to, but it's more important to eat or it's better to eat the wrong food with the right attitude than the right food with the wrong attitude. And we're at a point right now where modern life really does poison a lot of us. So it takes a certain amount of work to get us back into a way of eating in a way that keeps our body well and in balance. And the trouble is I like to think if we lived on Whole30 Island, and that's just what food was, was nourishing, nutrient-dense, anti-inflammatory food, it would be so easy to eat well and maintain a social life. But instead, we live in the modern American food landscape, or, you know, I don't know if you're in Canada, maybe. Yes. Yeah. So in the so North American food landscape is what I can speak to. And it's so isolating to eat well. Um, and so what I see is my patients start to cancel plans. They feel out of control when they're eating at a restaurant with friends. They isolate. They make their lives smaller in order to do this part-time job of meal prepping and eating in a particular way. And that even can evolve into orthorexia. They can become obsessive about eating in the right way. And obsessing over what to eat, that's not helping anybody's anxiety. And so we need to strike this balance where Food is something we're doing to nourish ourselves and not irritate our system. And yet we still associate it with pleasure and ease and gathering in community and breaking bread together or gluten-free bread. And so that's a balancing act that most of us have to figure out for ourselves. But I think that I, I start with that Mr. Fix-It attitude of here's 50 things you can do to just be less anxious chip away at all the false anxieties, get rid of the avoidable anxiety. We don't need that unnecessary suffering. Get it out of the way. But what trumps all of those efforts is that at the very end of the day, humans, we are social creatures. It is in our hardwiring. On the savanna, we were not the fastest. We were not the strongest. We were the ones that figured out how to cooperate. And for that reason, we feel safe when we're part of the tribe. And when we feel isolated 
ostracized, alone, connecting only to our devices, um, we feel uneasy in a very deep way. And so, and I think also on a very just spiritual level, or maybe a psycho spiritual level, all that really matters is our relationships. And so everything else can melt away. I do think it's important to put some effort into keeping ourselves well, but community and connecting to the people that we care about trumps absolutely everything else. So I eat that croissant and and reclaim pleasure and ease with foods that ordinarily make me feel unwell, but I bring an attitude of resilience and anti-fragility to it. And when I have an opportunity to sit with my friends around a dinner table and eat the wrong foods and drink the wrong wines and talk until 2 a.m. and squander all of my sleep hygiene, um, I really, I do that like absolutely fiercely and unapologetically. <laughs> and I know that even though on a false anxiety perspective, I'm putting myself into a state of imbalance, but on a much more important level, I'm filling my cup with everything that actually matters. And I can imagine, I, I definitely feel for people, especially people that are going through a mental health challenge, if they have anxiety or depression where, you know, it can be hard to get out of bed let alone make those plans with friends. And then there's the whole layer of people that have neglected that and then they might have to go make friends, which can be a lot harder in, later in life. So what would you say to that person who comes to you and, and you're like, this is a piece of the puzzle that's missing for you. I understand right now, you know, your world is is closing in and it's hard to even get out the door and get to work in the morning. You're busy. You've neglected your friendships. This is an area that you need to reignite. How does somebody go about doing that? Yeah, it can be so hard. It's a it's a delicate dance. I think that um, if you're really unable to get out of bed, it can feel so overwhelming to do the false anxiety fixes. But then you just, I, I sort of presented my book as a buffet. You just glance at the buffet and see what you're drawn to. Is there one small change that feels accessible or approachable? Can you do that? Can you supplement with magnesium glycinate? Can you take a spoonful of sunflower seed butter just so you feel a little bit less blood sugar induced anxiety. And then if you've made a little incremental improvement, does the next thing become within reach? Then are you maybe maybe able to get out of bed and reach out to somebody that you have been out of touch with? I think most of us get really in our heads about why we can't connect. We feel insecure, we we fear rejection, we think we're awkward, we think that um, other people have so much going on and they don't want to see us. The fact is like when in doubt, that other person is also lonely. They're also starved for connection. Put yourself out there. Be vulnerable. Will you get rejected sometime? Totally. Sometimes because they just don't like you. <laughs> That's go That'll happen. Sometimes it's just not a fit. Sometimes people are busy and have no bandwidth. Modern life makes people really overscheduled. But keep trying. And I really think of that if you build it, they will come. Like it's such a good filter for who you actually want to hang out with is to create a social situation that you would enjoy. Um, if everybody else wants to go to the bar and shout over loud music and get drunk and that's not your thing, that is not the only way to hang out with people. You don't have to do that. You can say, I am having a dinner party or I'm hosting a game night or we're baking muffins and we're watching Dawson's Creek. That's like really dates me. But um, you can come up with what you would enjoy. We're meeting for hiking. We're taking a walk in the park and build that and see who's game for that. And it's actually a pretty useful filter for who you and you have more in common with. And I think that people that have barriers to socializing, like if it's not that you don't have friends, but you feel like you don't have time or energy for it, that's where you can really stand to lower your standards. So for me, like I have a busy practice writing this book, I have a daughter, I have a partner, everything. I feel like, you know, I need to clone myself. I want more time with all of these areas of my life. And I want to socialize and it feels impossible. So people at this point just kind of know, come over. Uh, the house is a mess. I am not cooking a three course meal. I'm not busting out the fine china. I am, we are ordering takeout. We're going to sit on the couches. You might be sitting in like a pile of Play-Doh and we're going to connect. And so you just remove the barriers. You don't have to look a certain way. Your house doesn't have to look a certain way. You don't have to cook in a certain way. You just remove all the barriers and make it realistic to have people come together. And you could argue that is going to form more meaningful connection, 
vulnerability back and forth between the two different parties. You know, you're not trying to put on a front when they come over with the way you're presenting yourself or your home. So I could see how that could create deeper, more meaningful conversations and friendships. It's very true. I mean, I would love to be able to cook for my friends. I would love for no one to have to step on a Lego unexpectedly. But um, yeah, but I think for the most part, you're right that when we drop all of these facades, then we can really show up as ourselves. It makes it safe for other people to show up as themselves. And that's ultimately a more authentic and fulfilling connection. And a point to end on, why is it so hard for us to be vulnerable and to drop all the masks and, and just be our true essence? I think that the human ego has a couple of really weird oddities. Like we talked about the menopause thing and it's like, there's just no way to adapt to it. And this is like one of those mistakes. Like when like the knee joint is not that well designed and vulnerability ego resistance is not that well designed why i don't know like when we when we need to apologize for something we just resist and resist and dig in our heels and it feels so terrible no i can't possibly apologize and then when we finally do everything feels softer and better why was it so hard to get there and when we think i couldn't possibly do that i can't put myself out there in that way i might be rejected Sometimes we are. And then it's like, okay, so that was rejection. It feels lousy. And tomorrow is a new day. Or we showed up and we were vulnerable. And it turns out much of the time, it made it safe for the other person to be vulnerable. And we come away feeling so connected, rushed with oxytocin, our bonding hormone, and like feeling grounded in what actually matters in this human experience is that connection with community. So what oddity makes us hesitant? The fear of rejection? I'm not even sure if it's an adequate explanation. I think it's like something funky about human wiring, but it always ends up being the right decision to show up. I mean, there are there is such a thing as oversharing. Um, it's not always the right decision. So we have to we have to find that edge for ourselves. But for the most part, let the fear of rejection not be a reason to not do it. Ellen, love the book, love the conversation. Very thoughtful. We went really deep. We're going to link up your book. We're going to link up all your social media in the show notes. Thank you so much for this. Jesse, thank you so, so much for having me here today. <laughs>